So welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Erica and I am one of the children's librarians here at the Berkeley Public Library. Um, I just want to tell you about a couple of upcoming events. Coming up on, the, on Thursday, the 17th, it will be the second session of our summertime kids yoga program. That starts at 4 p.m. and it's a fun way to just kind of release some tension and move around. On Friday the 18th, we will have uh, Animals of the Rainforest. So we will have Wild Mind that used to be Wildlife Associates and they will be talking all about Animals of the Rainforest and showing us some animals that they have on site. So if you really like animals, that's at 3 p.m. on Friday. So 4 p.m. for the Thursday program, 3 p.m. for the Friday program. And you can register for those programs on our website, berkeleypubliclibrary.org. I also want to draw your attention, since you guys are here for a math program, I put up some books about math behind me, like that's a possibility all about what might happen. And Math Curse by the great John Shashka. I've also got, hmm, how many guinea pigs can fit on a plane? And that is answers to your most clever math questions. There might be some thumpers in there. And then, because we're gonna be talking about math patterns, I see a pattern here, book a book about patterns. So, here we go. We're just about ready to get started, but before we get started, I would just like to say that the Berkeley Public Library acknowledges that we sit on the unceded traditional land of the Ohlone peoples. We honor with gratitude the land itself, as well as the Ohlone people who still live, work, and play in this region. The Berkeley Public Library condemns all forms of hatred, racism, and other forms of discrimination. We stand in solidarity with all marginalized people that have been subjected to hatred and intolerance and celebrate the differences that contribute to the strength of our community. Everyone is welcome here at the Berkeley Public Library. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kioma Kalkivan. Thank you, Erica. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be here today and talk to you about my favorite subject, math. I'll be sharing a little bit about my math journey, we'll discuss some real world math examples, and then we'll end with a really fun activity. So to start us out, I'd really like to get to know our audience a little bit. I'm going to ask some questions so that we can understand our group composition and learn more about who is here at today's program. So Erica, if you don't mind starting the poll for us, that would be great. All right, so the question here is, which one of these books or book series do you like the best? And we've got a lot of really good ones on the list. So see if you can choose your favorite. All right, I'll give it a couple more seconds to see. So Harry Potter was our clear winner here, but we had a series of unfortunate events, one crazy summer. And I think those were, those were the favorites. All right. Moving on to the next question. So the next question is, how old are you? If there's more than one person who is watching, you can all answer this. The idea is that it's multiple choice um, or select multiple. Um, and it's totally anonymous, so we don't know who's answering, but I just wanna know what ages do we have in the room with us? So we've got, we've got some little ones with us. We've got ages five and under, and then we have nine to 11 year olds. And then we have quite a few people who are 12 and up. So welcome everyone. Really happy you're all here. And I think we'll be able to talk about math. That's great for any age. And then the third question that we wanted to ask is about your favorite food. So you've got some great choices here. You've got pizza, brownies, salad, fruit, tacos, fries, I know for me, my number one is always gonna be fries. You cannot beat fries. Let's see if the group agrees with me. Ah, oh, fries is not getting enough love. 
I'm going to submit fries. It looks like our, our audience is heavily skewed with their favorite food. So let's go ahead and take a look at those results. Pizza is the clear winner. I'm not mad about it, but fries is definitely holding a special place in my heart. All right. Thank you so much for, for filling out the, the polls. It's really great to know the audience a little bit more to understand who's here. And you know, if we do get together and picnic together, we'll make sure that it's pizza and um, we can all share that together. So thank you for participating in the polls. And what I'd like to do is actually ask you one more question. And this time, ask if you don't mind answering in the chat. So in the chat, what I want to do is um, is ask everyone here, what do you think of when you think of math? And so please go ahead and share in the chat what you think of when you think of math. There's no right answer here. I just want to get an idea of, you know, what do you see in your day to day? How do you think about it? All right. Numbers, puzzles, all great forms of math. Equations, done a lot of equations in my day. Oof, but scary. Oof. Numbers and equations. Yeah, I think. Cooking, I love that. Great, so it sounds like we've got a few different ways that people think about math. I see fun and I see scary together. I see art, this is great. So what I'll do is I'd love to go ahead and actually share what I think of when I think of math. So for me, there's a lot of things that come to mind, but first of all, I always think math is really cool. Math is amazing, it shows up in everywhere in our lives. And math is really all about solving problems that help us make decisions, be efficient. And today we're gonna to talk about a few different ways that math shows up in our life. I know that someone wrote scary in the chat and honestly, I think math is really challenging and sometimes it's really scary. It isn't something that's necessarily easy for me. It takes a lot of time and effort and understanding and trying to actually like grasp the concepts. But at the same time, once I can, I can understand math and I can apply it to the things that I need and help it help my life. So at the end of the day, I think what really keeps me going is my love for math. I love the feeling, that satisfying feeling when I solve a math problem. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? It's so satisfying. Like when you shoot a basketball, and it just goes in perfectly, doesn't hit the rim, doesn't hit the backboard, just nothing but net. It feels so good. And that's how solving problems with math is for me. Even when it's tough, it's still fun and it's so satisfying. So when I think of math and solving problems, I think about finding patterns and similarities. I think there are so many patterns out there that if you take the time to really identify them and see them and you know try and find them, you'll see how different things fit together in ways that you wouldn't have expected. I think a lot of math is doing just that. And then lastly, I think of analytics. We actually did some analysis together just a few minutes ago with the polls. What we did is I asked a question and then I collected information or data about you to try and understand and draw conclusions about the group that we have here today. So what I figured out is that chances are, if we were to all read a book together, I'd choose a Harry Potter book. I would probably bring pizza. And based on the information and the data that I collected, I can make these like calculated decisions that will probably you know, make the most people happy. Analysis is something that I do a lot at work. But before I tell you about that, I want to share a little bit more about my life journey. Um, it's probably clear by now that I love math. So let me tell you how I got to feel this way. And I'll move to the next slide. So I actually grew up really close to here. I grew up in 
Albany, which is right the next town over, and I was involved in quite a few different activities. I loved music, I played the trumpet and the piano, I loved being outdoors and going camping, I played volleyball, I played basketball, um, and I really enjoyed all of these activities. But my mom always remembers that in fourth grade, I told her if I could do anything all day, I would do math problems and I would do multiplication forever. Anybody else feel that way? Anybody else in love with multiplication? So all through high school, I really liked math. And like I mentioned, math was all about solving problems. If you think about it in a way where it's not just numbers and it's actually meaningful, I think that really changes your approach to math. So I loved the idea of solving problems and all of the formulas there were to help me get to the correct answer. I never got tired of math because once I understood the formula and I was able to apply each problem, the, the formula to each problem, I could solve it and it just felt effortless. And it was so satisfying to write out all my steps in a logical order and watch the problem go from chaos to a simple solution. Lots of people love math for different reasons. Maybe you're like me and you love the rules, the logic, the ease of following the process. I'm definitely one of those people. I love seeing a problem and saying, oh, I just need to follow these steps and I'll know exactly what to do and I'll solve for X and we'll be good to go. How many of you feel that way? Put a plus one in the chat if that's something that gets you excited. If you just love the, the rules and the logic and the ease of following a process. All right, it looks like we've got some people who, who love that, great. So I went to college and I met a ton of people who love math for exactly the opposite reason. They love math because it allows you to be creative. Do you think of math as being something that, where you can be creative? The reason that this exists is because there's no one right way to solve a problem. As long as you follow the mathematical principles and the steps correctly, you can solve a problem any way you like and the answer will still be the same. That's really neat, right? You can think of it as driving a car. You have to follow some rules, like you have to drive on the right side of the road, you have to stop at stop signs and traffic lights, but you can drive in whatever car you want, in whatever lane you want, and you can listen to whatever music or audiobook you want to. You can be creative and make it your own. All right, moving on to the next slide. So when I got to college at UC Berkeley, go Bears, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to study, but I knew I kept wanting to take math classes because I enjoyed them and I didn't know what else I really wanted to do yet. But it was actually in college that I realized just how diverse math is. There's so many different branches of math. And at UC Berkeley, there's two main types that people study. There's pure math and applied math. So this is a map of mathematics. I know it's a lot, but there's a few things that I wanna highlight. But before I do, I wanna talk about what pure math means and applied math means. So applied math tries to model, predict, and explain things in our real world. And the idea here is that you can apply math to really any subject that you want. Economics, biology, statistics, you can apply it to almost anything you can think of. But pure math is a little different. Pure math solves problems that don't depend on the real world. Instead, they're based on the rules of math itself and the rules, the world of math. So they're a little different. And you can see here that we're split up. Um, pure math is in the more pink purple and um, applied math is in on the right side in blue. And there's two things that I wanna bring to your attention in this map that I think you'll probably recognize. One right here is the Rubik's cube. Hopefully you guys have seen a Rubik's cube before, people playing around with it. Um, it's basically a cube where every color is, uh, a, where every side is a different color. And then you can mix it up and then you can solve it again. So a Rubik's cube is based on a type of math called group theory. And group theory helps you determine which sides of the Rubik's cubes to move in order to solve it and make each side its own individual color again. 
And then on the right here, I have highlighted some dice. In the chat, let me know any games that you've played using dice. I know I have a few favorites for me. Um, I grew up playing Monopoly and it was always a really heated game in my house. Uh, Snakes and Ladders, Sorry, Settlers of Catan, Blackgammon, that's a great one. Any others that you guys can think of? I know that there's a ton out there. But anyways, in all of these games that use dice, Risk, excellent. Um, in all of these games that use dice, basically you're using math to calculate how likely you are to land on a particular space. And sometimes that's a good thing, right? You're calculating, oh, you know, chances are I'm going to, it's like a 50% chance that I will land on this spot that I'm looking forward to. And maybe it's a good spot and you win the lottery and, you know, it's free parking in Monopoly, but maybe it's not a great spot and you were hoping not to land on it. And the probability was low, but you still land on it anyways. And you like land on a snake in Snakes and Ladders. So this concept that I'm talking about is called probability. And it's the likelihood of the action you want to occur. So anytime that you are playing with the Rubik's Cube or playing a board game with dice, you're actually, there's mathematical concepts behind them. And you might not even notice. All right. So after I graduated from college, I started working as a data analyst at Genentech. Genentech is a company that helps research and make medicine available to people who need it, whether it's for cancer or asthma or any other diseases. Part of my job is to figure out how many people or patients need a particular type of medication and therefore how much medication do we need to make? How quickly do we need to make it? And where do we need to ship it out to? We survey our patients, kind of like how we did the poll, to understand how they feel after taking the medication. And we can use that to see if the medicine is actually improving their quality of life. We keep track of all this information and we're constantly looking to figure out how we can improve. Um, on the right-hand side here, I've listed a few different ways that we collect and use information and some of the tools that are involved. Are there any questions about anything that I've covered so far? Don't be shy, feel free to speak up or add it to the chat at any point during this, this presentation. And if not, I'll keep going. So math is everywhere. And I'd like you to take a moment to actually think about the ways that you ma use math outside of the classroom. We talked about a few right now, but maybe it's the activities that you do or the tools that you use. Share it with us in the chat. Let us know. The one that always comes to mind for me is money. When you're calculating your allowance or you are, you know, trying to calculate the, the change that you need for, you know, an extra candy bar or something like that at the store. There's a lot of examples out there. Adding a tip, really nice. Splitting a dinner bill, yes. Cooking, always. Playing basketball, you guys are on the money. No pun intended. Uh, but I think this is really great. You're totally on the right track. And we're going to talk about these examples that you've just mentioned. So baking. Baking is a really clear one. And I'm sure that especially with the pandemic, you guys are all super bakers um, at this point. And there was a lot of baking happening during quarantine. Um, but baking is essentially a type of cooking where precise measurement is really, really important. Whether you're baking a cake, making cookies, you need to make sure that you are measuring the correct amount of sugar, baking soda, baking powder, flour, because you need the proportions to be correct in order for the food to taste good. So you can use math to calculate um, and measure the amounts of whatever ingredients you're using. You can also use math to divide the batter and figure out, you know, if you're making brownies, are you gonna cut them in a certain way in a certain grid to get the maximum amount of pieces that you can? Um, maybe you're dividing the batter when you're making cookies and you should, if you divide the batter into smaller parts, you'll end up with more cookies. It will be smaller, but there will be more of them. 
So that's baking. Maps and directions. So maps are another place where math is at play. Many of you may have used Google Maps or seen your parents use Google Maps when they're driving to a new location for the first time and trying to figure out where to go. Um, Dextra's algorithm is a formula used to find the shortest path between two points. It's great if you're in a rush or it's a really hot day and you don't wanna walk, you wanna minimize the amount of walking time. So let's look at this example here. We've got the green triangle, which is Washington School. And the heart there is the Berkeley Public Library. You want to get from the school to the library without wasting time, but you can't walk just straight through in a straight line because if you're familiar with Berkeley, that's exactly where Berkeley High is and you have to walk around it. So do you think it makes sense to take the pink route or the blue route? Any thoughts here? Take a look at the map and see what you can try and decide. In the chat, the pink route. Oof, I do wish I could jump over Berkeley High. The amount of times I've gone around and around. Yes, in fact, the pink route is the optimal route for you to choose if you're trying to save time and walk quickly. I think that that's a great point. Um, <laughs> I do wish I could jump over Berkeley High. <laughs> but Dextra's algorithm helps us find the shortest distance and it can help us calculate the most effective way to travel. And I think that that's a really important thing when we're trying to save time and be efficient in our day-to-day -day lives. I don't know about you guys, but when I'm running late, I really want to get there ASAP. All right, sports. I know that it was already mentioned in the chat and you guys are completely right. Sports is, there's a lot going on in sports and there's a lot of math going on in sports, whether you're talking about a certain team or a certain player. In baseball, people commonly talk about a player's batting average and you'll, you'll hear people talk about stats all the time. Um, but batting average is a common thing in baseball. In soccer, you may look at the number of goals on game, the passes, the shots on target, and basic stats in basketball will include points, assists, rebounds, turnover, um, steals, blocks, you know, there's just so many things that you can actually look at and identify and try and measure. If you want to know which player is better, chances are you're using math to calculate those statistics and say, you know, we can talk about both the teams, but my team's always better. Go Warriors. Um, and you can use math to prove that you have more wins or that you are, you're performing at a better level. So on the right-hand side here, I have Steph Curry. Um, I have Steph Curry on the slide and I have a diagram of the basketball court. And essentially each circle shows where Steph Curry was when he was making a basket or he, when he was taking a shot. And the blue circle means that he made the basket. The yellow circle means that he missed it. So do you see any patterns here when you're looking at this diagram? What I notice is that there are lots of shots from the three-point line and lots of shots inside the box. But otherwise, I see a lot of white space. So not a lot from not the three-point line and not in the box. Um, and what I do notice is that there's certain places where there's large clusters of yellow circles. And so to me, this shows examples of patterns. And this shows me the places where Steph Curry is really, really good at taking shots and making them. But it also shows me places where he can spend some time probably you know, working on his shot, maybe on the left side of the court. And this, what I'm doing right here is really, you know, analyzing where he's having the most success on the court and where he could spend a little bit more time practicing. There are lots of jobs around sports analytics and sports analysts are constantly gathering this kind of information to help all of the players improve and focus on their pain point areas so that they can be the best player possible. 
music. So how many of you actually think about music and think about math? Because there's actually quite a bit of mathematical ideas in musical concepts. So when you think about musical instruments like the cello or the guitar, the way that the strings vibrate is what creates um, the pitches that we're talking about. And the amount of vibration or the, the vibration at certain frequencies is what makes the different sounds. Math explains those vibrations and those actual sound waves. So instruments are really mathematical actually. Cellos have a particular shape to resonate with their strings in the mathematical fashion. Musical timing is all about math. Drums use math to figure out how to divide the beat and keep time during rest. And the relationship between math and music is very complex, but it's constantly expanding. What you'll see here is that I've actually shown some sheet music and I've created an X and Y axis. So that essentially over time, you can see how the pitch is changing based on the notes and each note can be like a vertice on a graph. Next, we have art and architecture. So math can be really creative, like we've, talked to, like we've talked about, and art can be really analytical. Art that involves shapes, symmetry, proportion, measurement, they all use math. In fact, there's a full branch of math called geometry, which is just about shapes. And on the left here, we have a spirograph. And maybe you've used this when you were, um, you know, doodling a little bit, or maybe you've used it in other contexts. But essentially, a spirograph is all about measurement. Each of the teeth is very strategically placed and spaced out evenly so that we can create the kind of images and um, artwork that we do with it. And then to the right, we have a simple shape, a triangle, but you can see that when you keep using that simple shape over and over, it creates really complex and beautiful works of art. And all of these concepts that I just talked about are used in architecture as well. Any questions? Anything that I mentioned new to you? Or maybe you already knew about it. Hopefully there were some new things in there. All right, um, what I'd love to do at this time is actually ask a few more poll questions. Erica, do you mind setting that up for us, please? Thank you. So the question is, what kind of library events do you enjoy? This is multiple choice, so feel free to choose what you like. And the idea behind this is that Based on what you like, if we know, if we gather this information and we, you know, gather the information and then look at it and analyze it, we'll be able to figure out what are the best programs that we should be putting at the Berkeley Public Library. All right, we'll give it another two or three seconds. And then can we share those results, please? All right, so it looks like we have, we definitely love animal programs here at the Berkeley Public Library. And that's great news because I think Erica mentioned that we have one coming up just next week. So be sure to tune into that. Music is another one, storytelling, author events. I love author events. Yoga. Mm, these are all great. So yeah, but definitely looks like we've got a clear winner for animal programs. More math, please. Oh, I love that. All right. And then in terms of the STEM programs that you've been to, looks like a lot of people were at SS for Science. I was actually there too, and it was really, really fun. And then we've had people join the other ones as well. Excellent. And you're all here for Emma's for Math. Excellent. All right, let's move on to our activities now.
All right, so first I wanna go over this interesting Monty Hall brain teaser. Some of you may have heard it before, but if you haven't, I think it'll be really fun and interesting. So I have a scenario, scenario for you. I've hidden a prize behind one of these three doors. You get to pick a door, any door you want. And then as the host, I will choose one of the other doors and reveal whether or not there is a prize behind it. And then you will have to choose a second time which door you'd like to choose. So let's say you pick door number one. And then I, as the host, I'm gonna choose door number two. I open door number two and I say, oh, there's no prize behind here. So now you have to choose whether you wanna stick with door one or switch to door three. How many of you would stick with door one? Feel free to share it in the chat. Think about how many of you would switch to door three? How many of you would stick to door one? How many of you don't think that it matters whether you switch or not? All right, someone's gonna stick to door one here and someone else is gonna switch. Okay, it looks like we're pretty much, it looks like we're pretty much down the line. Some people would switch, some people would not. So how do you decide? How do you actually determine what is the better option here? Math, math is how you decide. And if you want to know whether it matters whether to switch doors or not, math can help you find out. Math is a decision-making tool and it can help you in all sorts of situations, including this one. So I wanna make sure that we don't underestimate math and we always make sure that we look at where we can calculate and create logic in our decisions. And what I will do later on is share in the chat the actual answer to this problem. But the answer is you should switch. All right. Next activity. So now we're going to move to an activity that is based on a game called set. Some of you may have played it before. It's a family favorite at my house. And the idea here is to take a look at all of the cards on the board and identify common attributes or characteristics that these cards have and categorize them into specific groups or sets. So in these cards, the characteristics that we're looking at are shape, color, and number. So on this board, it looks like we have two different kinds of shapes, diamond and oval. We have three colors, red, green, purple. And for numbers, we have either one shape, two shapes, or three shapes on each card. And to help identify each card, I've actually put in a letter. So when you want to refer to a certain card, you can just say card A or card E. Um, but to make a set, the cards must have at least two common characteristics or attributes. So that means that they must share the same shape and the same color, or maybe they share the same number and the same color. As long as they have two common characteristics, they form a set. So as an example, let's take a look at card I and card J in the last row to see if they're a set. And right here, I can see that we have a different shape. So that, that is not a characteristic in the set, but they have the same color. They're both purple. And each card only has one shape in the card. So they share the same number. Since they have those two common char characteristics, they make a set. Now, what I'd love for you to do is see if you can find sets. Write in the chat the letters for each card and, and let me know what sets you see. I'll give everyone a few minutes right here and then I'll share with you the sets that I see. All 
All right, well, let's take a look now. So right here, this is an example of a set. Let me just look the chat here. So D and I form a set. They have the same shape because they're both ovals. They don't share the same color because one is purple and one is green, but they do share the same number. There is one of each shape in each card. So because of the shape and because of the number, D and I form a set. I want to bring up one interesting point here. D and I make a set. And actually, there's one more card that belongs in that set, and that's card K. Card K is a different color, but it is the same shape, and it's the same number of shapes. Are you guys seeing more sets as you're taking a look at it? Here's another set that I see. It's C, G, and J. So in this set, our shape is the diamond and our color is purple. Therefore, these three cards together form a set. And then I think now I'm gonna challenge everyone and see if you can find a four card set, which means that they will share at least two attributes and there will be four cards that you're looking at. I'm looking in the chat here. I see someone wrote E and H. That is definitely a set, you got that correct. And that actually might be helpful when you're trying to find the four card set. Does anybody see it yet? I think someone in the chat does. Oh, well, I guess I had a three card set as well. So here we have A, E, and H. And essentially they have the same shape and the same color. And that's what makes them a set. And now E, B, G and H make up our four card set. So well done to everyone who saw that. Good eyes. Well done noticing the patterns, finding the similarities and grouping them together. That's exactly what math is. That's exactly what data, an data analysis is too. All right, are there any questions about anything that I've spoken about? Is there anything that you feel like I didn't cover with math, a, a favorite part of math for you that we didn't talk about today? There is so much more math out there. So I definitely did not cover everything. This was just some of the math concepts and the real world examples that I interact with on a daily basis, but there's probably more out there too. There's definitely more out there. All right, well, before we end, I wanted to share with you a few books at the library that I love that are all about math. So there's some fiction, there's some nonfiction books here, there's stories, puzzles, games, and all things that you can read or do with your family. You can check them out at your library, talk to Erica or your librarian to find out even more math books that exist and that you wanna look at. I think Erica actually had a few of them in her background. She might still. Um, I think Math Curse was one that was mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. So there's lots of great books out there and they're really fun. So I highly recommend you check them out. And I uh, just want to let you guys know that in the chat, back when we started the set game, I put in a link. And Kioma, I think that was a link to the directions to how to play. So the link should have, um, if you enjoy playing SED, they have a daily online game that you can play each day. 
And you can also go ahead and purchase the game yourself and play at home. Thank you so much, Kilma. This was wonderful. Thank you. It was such a pleasure to be here today and discuss math with you, my favorite subject. Um, and I think that as you go through life, you'll just keep seeing that math is everywhere. It continues to amaze and delight me. And I hope that you'll notice a little bit more math in your day-to-day -day world after this. Um, you can use it for decision-making, as you travel, as you cook, and for everything and more. So thank you for joining me today. And thank you for having me.